Um, whenever you're ready, please. Welcome. Oh, you're on mute, Jay. Sorry, Jay, I think you're muted still. Uh, you're, hi, Jay. Whoop. Can't hear you. Okay, somehow that got me. There we go. Let me start over. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chris, for arranging things. I've been glad to test things with you and to talk to you. I'm impressed with everything you've done for your club and what I've heard in the last half hour. Uh, I've known George Doshek for a long time, and I'm glad he suggested me to give this talk. I started on eclipses, coincidentally, uh, when there was one two weeks after I started college, uh, some decades ago, and uh, uh, and I've been to just about all the eclipses for uh, many decades, certainly the total eclipses. And uh, at the end, I will talk about the eclipse we're still trying to get to in South America next month and the, uh, the next few eclipses. So let me share my screen here. Allow. There it is. Let's go to the PowerPoint. So, are you seeing things now? Yes, sir. Yes. It looks great. Good. Yes. Good. So, I have been uh, studying various aspects of total solar eclipses. Here's uh, one of our composite images, uh, and uh, and here we have a, a solar minimum eclipse, and we're just passing solar minimum uh, now. But in the solar minimum, we get these streamers that go off to the sides, but there are not streamers at very high latitudes, so we can see the polar plumes. Uh, coming out of the North Pole and the South Pole, uh, looking a lot like uh, like a bar uh, magnet. Uh, so I do have a, a research a series of observations and colleagues I work with. You'll hear some of those names in a, in a little while. I'm very glad to have support uh, for, from the Solar Terrestrial Program of the Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences Division of the National Science Foundation. Uh, and uh, we've had other other support from Williams College and the NASA Massachusetts Space Grant and Sigma Xi and National Geographic in the, uh, in the past. Maybe you uh, have seen the uh, Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope's first releases. Uh, I'm not yet working with that telescope, though, they're on a, though I am on a proposal to observe the edge of the sun uh, as that, uh, as that uh, uh, project progresses. But in any case, I thought I would to start by showing you uh, some of the uh, recent images from this big solar telescope. It used to be thought that we didn't need big telescopes for the sun, but now that we spread the spectrum out so much uh, and we want high time resolution, uh, it, uh, it turned out that we needed more aperture. Uh, and uh, obviously with support from Congress where uh, Senator Inouye was for a, uh, for a long time, uh, on Maui and Hawaii, they have built the uh, Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. Uh, they've released some uh, images of the granulation. Um, I was supposed to go with uh, students there uh, in a month, in two months, or during a January term. Uh, but uh, a, they're, they're behind there, and b, I'm not allowed to take you know, students now with the current uh, with the current COVID. Uh, but anyway, uh, when they released their results, it even made the front page of the New York Times of, above the fold, which is impressive for a science project. Uh, and, uh, and the movies are just wonderful, uh, zeroing in on solar granulation near the center of the disk. Uh, this is uh, less than an arc minute across, and you can see the granules uh, develop uh, in uh, in white light, uh, and a close up uh, of that just shows uh, shows them developing over and over again, uh, and you see they're not really just 
appearing and disappearing, they, they morph and, uh, and spread outward. Uh, and uh, these are a boiling phenomenon uh, on the sun that uh, comes up uh, from what you call the convection zone about a third of the way down into the sun. We are at the moment at the uh, minimum of the sunspot cycle. Uh, here is the last few cycles as of last week, no November 1st. It's kept at the, uh, uh, the uh, in solar indices uh, data center at the Royal Observatory uh, in Belgium. And you can see that the most recent cycle uh, had a double peak. Northern and Southern hemispheres uh, actually peaked at different times. But you can see it was a low cycle compared to the previous cycles. Maybe there's some longer series, an 80-year series, and 240-year series that people talk about. But in any case, we are just passing solar minimum. And we had a very low, uh, very low minimum. So maybe there are some long, longer cycles uh, here. Uh, we solar astronomers keep track not only of the numbers of sunspots on the sun, and they're grouping into uh, sunspot groups, but also the latitudes at which there are sunspots. So here is a graph of the latitude on the sun uh, then over time. And you can see that the new cycle has spots that appear at, uh, at well, it's uh, halfway up. We don't have any sunspots near the poles, uh, but uh, then as the uh, sunspot cycle uh, continues, the sunspots appear closer and closer to the equator. They don't really uh, reach the equator, uh, but then the magnetic field disperses and resurrects with a polar reversal uh, of, the, of the magnetic field. Um, and uh, so we see the variations. Here's a wonderful amateur astronomer uh, picture uh, that, uh, that appeared in uh, I believe Sky and Telescope uh, a month or so ago, just looking how blank the sun actually was on the 4th of July, although there was a prominence magnetic field holding gas uh, over, the, uh, over the limb. This is today's sunspot image taken from spaceweather.com, and you can see that there is a northern group and a larger southern, uh, southern group uh, so, the, and these are from the new cycle. My team has been studying the uh, shape of the corona, among other things, over, uh, over uh, many cycles now. Uh, and, and here uh, we see uh, a, the composite image that you saw already from 2017. And I travel with a, a gaggle of students from Williams College Two, in particular, Christian Lockwood, um, who I spoke to on, uh, on Zoom a little while ago, uh, did a, a thesis with me and, and uh, working on the observations uh, uh, on site in, uh, in, Salem, uh, in Salem, Oregon. Um, and he is now about to go to Australia to help Mondantowitz uh, observe the re-entry of the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft on December 6th, uh, from which we hope he can get back just in time to see the December 14th eclipse thus in South America. And then one of the things that I have been studying uh, over the last years is why the solar corona is millions of degrees hot. There are a number of solutions to that theoretical problem. Its problem has been solved, but the last list uh, I saw by Steve Kramer of the number of solutions that there are is uh, 17. So 17 different people think they solved it in 17 different ways. It obviously means we don't really know exactly why uh, the solar corona is, uh, is millions of degrees. Uh, I'll show you some observations that indicate that. Uh, in any case, one of the things that I have been doing is getting some observational testing for some of these models. And in particular, there are some loops of coronal gas at the edge of the sun. And one of the theories uh, has those loops vibrating with periods uh, shorter than one second uh, by something uh, known as surface alphane waves. And so we are looking uh, through 
very narrow band filters, uh, one angstrom or so filters in what are called the coronal red line and coronal green line from, uh, from the hot coronal gas to, uh, and uh, at, during the eclipse and then analyzing to look for these short period oscillations. You all know that, uh, that we had the big eclipse uh, crossing the United States in 2017. So I propose to show you some of our observations from, uh, from that eclipse uh, and also then the most recent total solar eclipse, which we observed from Chile in, uh, in 2019. And I'm sure many members of the club uh, saw uh, oh, at least one and maybe both uh, of those. There are some wonderful mapping that are going on. This one is by Fred Espinak. Uh, also, Michael Zeiler uh, is a professional map maker, does eclipse maps. And Xavier Jubier from, uh, uh, from France has an online uh, mapping uh, program that I rely on all the time. Here, we went to Salem, which we just passed over with the shape of the uh, of the umbra, and you can see that it really looks polygonal uh, rather than, than just an ellipse or, uh, or a circle. Uh, so Ernie Wright of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center has worked out the details of, of the mapping and, and of, the, uh, of the way that the mountains on the moon affect the actual shape of the umbra. And I've worked with him on comparing these simulations uh, with the actual observations. We worked with Xavier Jubier also. Uh, uh, Ernie uh, works with the visualization from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, so now, for the last few years only, uh, we actually know the size of the moon and the 3D mapping uh, so that with the various uh, librations we can uh, predict accurately the Bailey's beads and the shape of the uh, of the shadow. Uh, and here is a, one of the uh, visualizations uh, from uh, from uh, Ernie and NASA's visualiza visualization studio uh, of the eclipse falling on the United States in uh, in 2017. And uh, I went with a big team, including uh, eight students from Williams College and another half a dozen of our uh, astrophysics major, uh, astronomy major alumni, plus uh, scientific colleagues. And we were at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, the president of which uh, happens to be an astronomer, pulsar astronomer, we were very well uh, treated, uh, treated there. Uh, and we were able to observe from a, a, a deck outside their computer center that had uh, good computer access and electricity and various things we need for our observations. Uh, Christian put together this nice composite uh, and we're actually having a debate on the solar eclipse uh, mailing list now what to call uh, eclipses because this one is a, we call a total eclipse though there are these partial phases that you see on the lower left the two images, but of course those have a filter in front of the sun that lets only about one part in a hundred thousand or a million uh, through with a slight orange leak, the way this particular filter from Towson Oaks Optical uh, is made. And then in the center we see a, a diamond ring effect, and then the inner corona and the top right, the outer uh, corona. Uh, and with the, the simulations, we can match those with with what Xavier has calculated for different sizes of the sun and actually measure the size of the sun more accurately than it had been, uh, been known. But here we see a nice sequence of uh, diamond ring and Bailey's beads uh, with a solar prominence uh, there. And again, the uh, inner corona with, uh, with prominence and, uh, and the beautiful uh, prominence uh, hanging off the apparent edge of the sun at that 2017 uh, eclipse uh, in H alpha. And here is one of the uh, composite that Christian has, uh, has put together. So uh, we can 
uh, do various uh, compositing to, with various contrasts. We can make it uh, uh, examine the contrast more more than what the eye would see. Um, and then Chris, uh, and then Nico Lifado from Paris has put together 646 images of this most recent eclipse for uh, for a fabulous eclipse image that extends way way out into space uh, beyond even where the coronagraph the Naval Research Laboratory goes. So I'll talk about that uh, later. Uh, anyway, here is a solar diagram from uh, my most recent article in Scientific American uh, about which was about the Great American Eclipse of of, uh, of 2017. So I've shown you already some uh, some sunspots, and uh, we're, we're looking at the. This is a little big in scale, but this is the kind of uh, coronal loop in which we're looking for these uh, oscillations um, in, with whatever period. And we uh, are, and the model, particularly with testing, has uh, uh, shorter than one uh, than one second uh, period. And then we have the streamers going out, uh, especially equatorially. Uh, but as we go down, we have the convection zone uh, that is leading to those uh, granules on the surface and outside of the, uh, of the solar uh, chromosphere, which is actually what I did my PhD thesis about uh, long ago. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't actually about eclipses, it, uh, it turns out. Anyway, another uh, composite here, various partial phases uh, leading into totality. And I love especially the very earliest partial phase when we know that, that the predictions are right. Nobody's going to jump out from behind the bush and, sh and shout April Fool that we sent you here on the wrong day or in the wrong, uh, in the wrong place. The predictions are really very accurate uh, in these, these days. We work uh, to get what you see here in this uh, black and white zone of, of the eclipse. And it turns out that the solar corona is about a thousand times brighter here than it is there. So no one CCD image or film or, or, uh, or whatever uh, is going to um, uh, show the, the uh, range there. And you have to, excuse me, one minute, I see I have to plug my computer in, sorry. No worries. I thought I had enough juice to get through this talk, but that's not what the screen is telling me. All right, now it's, now it's plugged in. So anyway, uh, the uh, coronagraph, there were three coronagraphs sent up uh, by the Naval Research Laboratory uh, and, and with the help of, of uh, NASA, uh, but it's on a European spacecraft, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. It's been up for 25 years or so. And uh, the inner coronagraph went almost down to the surface and was a traditional LEO type uh, coronagraph. And at one point we did an eclipse observation to uh, match that field of view and, uh, and tell them what their scattered light was. But then Soho went haywire and started spinning and, and when it came back, that C1 coronagraph uh, wasn't working anymore. So this is the so-called C2 coronagraph, which is an externally occulted coronagraph and they have to occult uh, not only the, uh, uh, the bright everyday sun, uh, but also uh, the inner, uh, well, radius or, or so. And so it's left for us at an eclipse to fill in the missing observations to get a complete view of the sun. Uh, and here we've also pasted over the silhouette of the moon, which would otherwise be black, uh, an image from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. And you can see some active regions on the disk there. And we like to trace the streamers back uh, through our eclipse image uh, onto where they are based on the surface of the sun. Uh, and of course, now we're only looking at the front side of the sun um, and, and half the streamers will go back to the far side of the sun. There is a C3 coronagraph external uh, to that, and I think you'll see an image from that uh, from that later. So, Jay, with that last image, we're looking at, if I understood you correctly, we're looking at at least three images that are put together. Yes. Here, you've got the the outer red. Yeah. The, the, so the red, is, is, red is, is the C2 
image summit. from Naval Research Laboratory. And then this is our eclipse composite here. Uh, and just because the center of the moon was black, we've pasted a, uh, a NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory image there. Understood. Okay, thank you, sir. So we're trying to connect up those three images to get a complete view of the sun from the surface uh, to way out into space. The NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has uh, a series of satellites up. At the moment, they're up to GOES 16 and 17. Uh, and so looking down at the Earth, you're familiar uh, more usually with the infrared uh, with that shows, especially the cloud cover. This is the visual sequence that you can see the actual shadow of the moon crossing over the Earth. So it really is a, uh, it really is a real uh, phenomenon. And later on, I'll show you some images that were taken with a solar telescope that is mounted on GOES-16 uh, because some bright individual figured out that even though the cameras uh, for its main purpose are pointing down at the Earth, it's got solar panels that are always pointing at the sun. So now they, uh, they mount a solar telescope with several different filters uh, in, the, uh, in the solar panels. But anyway, here's the actual shadow crossing the Earth. And as I said, we, uh, we wanted to get the eclipse uh, as soon as it hit the, uh, the United States. So I was in Salem, Oregon. And I uh, also choose where I go using um, maps that show the cloudiness from the spacecraft put together by the meteorologist Jay Anderson um, from Canada, who does eclipse meteorology. And he and I actually have a new Peterson field guide to weather uh, that is in press now and will be out in uh, six months or, uh, or so. Uh, anyway, uh, we uh, got the uh, shape of the corona and, uh, and made these composites uh, in Salem, Oregon, where I showed you. But there were other observers spaced across the country, of course. So even though we only got a couple of minutes of totality, uh, there were over an hour of totality altogether if you space telescopes out along the path. And here is a blink between our observations and one taken from Southern Illinois 65 minutes later. That's a location that'll get the 2024 eclipse also. But look at some of the features here, for example, that in the 65 minutes, and, and you know how big the sun is and how far it is away at 92 million miles. So these are really fast velocities that we're, uh, that we're watching. And you can see different changes in the polar plumes and you can see uh, features moving around. Uh, so we're measuring uh, the dynamics uh, at, at the eclipses. The last total eclipse up to now uh, went over the Pacific and then hit uh, the lower part of South America, uh, first Chile and then sunset over in Argentina. So we wanted to get it as high as possible in the sky. I do prefer to be on dry land whenever possible because then we can have solid bases for our telescopes. But even so, it was only 13 degrees above the horizon. So we didn't do the oscillation experiment because of uh, the feared atmospheric uh, uh, oscillations that we would have to contend with, uh, but we did have all kinds of other observations. You can see the shadow here about to hit uh, South, uh, South America. And so there's the shadow moving across and you see it's, it's uh, meeting uh, the uh, Terminator for the day-night Terminator there too. So here is Ernie's um, simulation of the partial phases uh, coming out, 24, 60, 80 uh, percent partial phases, and then, uh, and then centrally the, the umbra, which is very elongated, way out. But my friend, Glenn Schneider, uh, arranged to fly right about where it is now, near the central portion, and managed to extend totality to eight and a half minutes uh, in that way. Um, and of course, it, it set the camera uh, uh, with him. But, so they had a charter 787 uh, out of Easter Island to uh, see that. And I understand there's going to be an annual eclipse over Easter Island in 2024 that we're starting to organize after the American eclipse of, 20, uh, of 2024. So anyway, here's the path over uh, Southern South America, where we had just over a couple of minutes of totality. Uh, I work 
for a long time with uh, a wonderful uh, Greek uh, instrumentation builder, Aris Bulgaris, and here and uh, and then I was awarded um, a slot for four of my people on Sarah Tololo the, at the Inter American Observatory for uh, for the eclipse. I had already organized for uh, myself to be with some students uh, and others at the center line. Uh, so Sarah Tololo was not quite in the center line. They didn't have quite as long a total as we had, but in any case, I was able to send uh, four people uh, to the uh, to Sarah Tololo, uh, and uh, so my deputy there was my alumnus from Williams College, Kevin Reardon, who's now on the staff of the National Solar Observatory, and uh, David Slisky and, and Alan Slisky as, as instrumentationists, and uh, and then Aris uh, Bulgaris had a spectrograph and. And, uh, and here we see, uh, and, and of course he had imaging too. So the, we have a double diamond ring here, a second contact and, uh, and a single uh, set of beads evolving here at third uh, contact. So I do study a variety of things at the eclipse. Uh, we, we're studying the magnetic field, changing over the sunspot cycle. We're, when we have coronal mass ejections, we are uh, looking at them and, and their velocities and their and their shapes. So there wasn't one of that eclipse, but there sometimes is. And then we're particularly interested in the hot gas, iron that has lost 13 of its 26 electrons. So it's known as iron 14. Neutral iron is one. So the ionization stage is one off from the Roman numeral. Iron 10 is a little cooler, a little less than a million degrees. And we were studying argon 10 at that time, which is nine times ionized uh, argon. Uh, and then we use these uh, frame transfer charge coupled devices to uh, to look for the coronal oscillations that I mentioned. And then we have the changes in velocities. And the uh, Venezuelan atmospheric physicist Marcos Peñalosa Murillo spent a year with me at Williams College um, on a Fulbright and, and, and again last year. Um, some additional time and we've been studying the effect of the uh, sharp um, removing of the sun from the Earth's atmosphere and how that affects the atmospheric temperature and pressure uh, and, and what gravity waves radiate out from the side of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, here is the sunspot graph uh, as of uh, last week. Uh, and you can see in the yellow that most of the days in 2018, 2019, 2020, there have been no sunspots on the sun uh, at all. And these daily observations are, are uh, Average monthly and smoothed out, and we're just beginning to get some more, uh, some more sunspots. We did observe uh, then in 2019 uh, from the 7,240 foot altitude for just over two minutes uh, with that other team, and then I was on the center line, 2,500 foot altitude, two minutes and 35 seconds, uh, and we were particularly worried about a marine layer coming in. It was winter time there in July second but it turned out to be a beautifully clear day and then so that even from la serena uh, from the hotel uh, there was good observations and then uh, glenn and people from the chartered 787 with my camera there at 41,000 feet got almost eight and a half minutes of totality a thousand kilometers north of easter island but they did have to look through these now electronically controlled windows on the 787 though so there was a certain uh, lack of resolution introduced by the windows there. And of course, I'm grateful to the uh, NSF uh, Solar Terrestrial Program, Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences Division for their uh, support. Uh, we were uh, uh, in uh, Santiago and around there for days before, uh, before the eclipse, we were able to go out to, uh, uh, to see the, well, to see the clock in Vina del Mar, the flower, the flower clock at some of, some of my alumni uh, with me and family uh, are with me and my uh, three students from Williams College who were with me on that occasion. And here is the path as it hit the center line here at uh, La Higuera. My travel agent, uh, Mark Sud, had done a reconnoitering trip and made some arrangements uh, there too, which worked out uh, very well. And this is the kind of display that Xavier Dubier's uh, program gives where we get all the all the times and they 
and the altitudes and azimuths, et cetera, position angles, and the maximum and, and, uh, uh, and durations. So his, um, his program, his uh, programs are on the web and they're linked in an easy to get way through a website at eclipses.info. So just http colon slash slash eclipses.info is a website that I run for the working group on solar eclipses of the International Astronomical Union, which I chair, and we have posted their links to Xavier's maps and other useful things for those planning eclipse expeditions. We work also with uh, Professor Patricio Rojo, uh, Cornell uh, PhD, who is a professor at the University of Chile, and he flew a drone over, over us. So, uh, so here is our lunch tent and people uh, uh, around uh, observing, uh, observing the uh, eclipse, prepared to observe uh, the eclipse, and uh, which was in the down direction there and up this path on a little higher level. We had a smaller tent, and my students and I were, were up there. Here's uh, Aaron Matters and uh, Christian Lockwood uh, bringing up some equipment uh, there, and, and here are the uh, students prepared to, uh, uh, to observe. So, uh, and here from the drone, we see uh, a setup of, of uh, cameras there. The spectrographs were up on Saratololo, and we also had a temperature measuring device. And then we had a team from China who were there, and, and uh, Alphonse Sterling from uh, uh, NASA Huntsville were there, and a tourist group with us on here for those observations and looked at the sky was just clear. Uh, and we just got a beautiful view. Uh, here is the shadow. This is a movie. You'll see the shadow gradually move across from left to right. And as soon as it goes far enough, then we get the diamond ring effect. And the total phase of the eclipse is, is over. And obviously, we were enthralled and we were particularly relieved that in the middle of the winter and so low in the sky, we were able to see the eclipse and record our observations uh, so well. We had uh, borrowed a wonderful uh, Nikon lens from Dan Schechter, uh, who was along, and he got this very nice uh, series. Uh, he's a, a professor at medical school in California. He's from Long Beach, California. The sky was even darker from the higher site at Cerro Tololo. So here, uh, David Sliski, who's a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, got this uh, beautiful a view of the umbra uh, with the totality in the, in the middle. And at the lower right and lower left, we are looking far enough out, a couple of hundred kilometers, that we're seeing light scattered in from outside the, uh, the umbra. Here is a comparison uh, between Aris's observations with the diamond ring, uh, second and third contact put together there, and on the right, a simulation that uh, Xavier made in the free parameter. And Xavier's uh, uh, calculations is the size of the sun, because now we know the 3D size of the moon very accurately. Uh, and so we can say uh, more accurately than was previously known what the size of the sun is. Uh, here is the uh, uh, Xavier's map, the Google map. Uh, of, of where uh, Saratololo, well, of where uh, La Serena is, uh, a little nearer to the center than, Sar uh, than Saratololo. And you see the sky is not quite as dark, but nonetheless, it was a beautiful eclipse uh, from, from La Serena, the headquarters city for the observatories. Uh, and here is uh, just a, a nice picture. My son-in-law and grandson uh, took from, uh, from La Serena of the diamond ring effect. There was a, a, a meeting going on of the uh, International Astron Astronomical Union, a symposium a little north of totality. Uh, and uh, so the a day after the eclipse, or a couple of days after the eclipse, I was able to give them a summary paper with some of our observations. And that is now uh, in press in the proceedings of the meeting. And then uh, my students and colleagues and I 
uh, presented a paper at the uh, January meeting of the American Astronomical Society um, and uh, uh, well, to which I went following the uh, last December's annular eclipse of the sun in India. So we continued around the world to Hawaii and uh, presented at that meeting and then continued uh, uh, going east to Los Angeles and Washington and then back to Williamstown, Massachusetts, where I am now. And then not a surprise to you that we haven't been able to travel uh, since uh, since the, after that time. But anyway, here are uh, Aris's observations of the uh, the uh, <coughs> baby's bead and diamond ring and an eclipse image, totality image in the, uh, in the middle. Now, the day after the eclipse, uh, we were able to uh, to work with uh, predictive science incorpor incorporated from San Diego. We've been working with them uh, longer uh, than that, and uh, NASA had uh, put up uh, a comparison of, uh, of their image with our observations. So here are calculations that that, uh, that they have uh, have made, and. Uh, and the people we work with there, Ronald Kaplan, Cooper Downs, John, uh, John Linker, uh, and co-authors of the paper we gave. So they calculate on the basis of the magnetic field measurements that have been made for the preceding month uh, in order to see what's on the backside of the sun. And they have uh, programs that can calculate what the corona should look like. And by seeing what's similar and what's different from the actual observations, uh, from their final prediction released a few days before uh, before the eclipse. If this was a week before the uh, the eclipse, we can help refine their, uh, their program. So here is a morphing uh, on the NASA site uh, between the, the bluish is their prediction and the grayish is, is, our, uh, is our calculation. And I just did hear from the people at NASA Goddard uh, uh, a few days ago that uh, they want to do the same again for next month's uh, total solar, uh, solar eclipse. Uh, so here, here is uh, a still with uh, their, their image on the left and our image on the right that we haven't adjusted the contrast uh, to match uh, exactly, but, uh, but there's a good, uh, a good agreement. Uh, and uh, uh, and also, uh, well, uh, Professor, uh, well, uh, at the Naval Research Laboratory, uh, Professor Yang uh, also makes uh, predictions on the basis of the magnetic field we're compared with his predictions also. We're particularly interested in the spectra. And uh, many of you know that at the eclipse in 1868, uh, Jules Janssen from France uh, took a then newfangled portable spectrograph and he noticed a bright a yellow line and he thought it was so bright maybe he could even see it the next day uh, without the eclipse, which did work out. But he realized that the, this yellow line was near but not exactly at the sodium D line. So this is D1 and D2. It became called D3. Uh, and then soon, um, Norman Lockyer in England, a few months later, uh, got a spectrograph and was able to study these lines again without the eclipse. And uh, they didn't know wh why there was this extra yellow line, so they said it came from helium because it existed only in the sun. So that was the discovery of helium uh, several decades before uh, geoscientists on Earth isolated the gas uh, uh, separately. Uh, and then the following year, uh, Charles Young uh, and, and Harkness uh, found a green, uh, well, uh, found a green line uh, in at an eclipse in the corona. So that we call that we call it the coronal green line. And it took till 1940, so it took about 70 years before it was uh, figured out by Grotrian and Adlane, especially uh, that it was from iron that had been heated so hot that it had lost 13 of its normal 26 electrons. And that was the proof that the corona 
was very hot. There had been an indication at growth rate and before that, uh, and that the Fraunhofer lines, uh, the normal absorption lines in the solar spectrum were scattered so widely that they barely showed, and you can measure uh, measure those. Uh, but this was definitive that there were lines from highly ionized things, and these other strong, the second strongest line is from nine times ionized iron, so that's a little cooler than this. And we actually uh, want to observe all the eclipses to measure in a calibrated way the ratio of the strengths of the iron 10 and iron 14 lines. And it turns out that we can see the overall temperature of the corona change from a little hotter with a greater than one ratio of iron 14 to iron 10 at solar maximum to a reversal, and the iron 10 line is stronger when we get to solar minimum. Of course, there's a reversal point. And then uh, iron 14 may be stronger, and these are what are called slitless spectra, where the narrow corona brightness uh, is, is used to show a whole image uh, rather than just have a single slit uh, along it. And, and much fainter is uh, nine times ionized argon, which gives us a, a, another uh, temperature uh, value. And we actually had borrowed from the Big Bear Solar Observatory uh, Leo filter. Um, that started at H alpha, but Aris modified it to make an image in argon 10 and on band and off band. Uh, we could do a subtraction, but it's very hard to pull the actual signal uh, imaging out, but we can see it here uh, on the spectrum. So, Dr. Paskov, can you yes. uh, flop back to just go back to one slide to that last spectra that you were showing? A lot of us are familiar with with um, spectrographs, and you know, with with emission and absorption spectroscopy that shows um, ver you know truly you know distinct vertical lines on things. Can you help um, help me understand what it is we're we're seeing here? Because okay. this is one could from a traditional one could spectrum. put a spectrograph slit across the sun and have a vertical line here. Mm -hmm. And then we'd see images of that vertical line of, of the sun at all different wavelengths. Uh, but then we'd only have that one vertical line, and we only have a couple of minutes to get the whole spectrum. So what we traditionally do in solar astronomy is because the corona itself is so narrow, or the chromosphere is narrow, uh, we just let it image itself uh, and uh, and there are only a few emission lines, so it's not that there, that there are all these uh, absorption lines that are blurring out. So we see a whole set of images that are uh, dispersed. Okay. So there's a little bit of range of... So each line would have its own wavelength, uh, and, and so uh, you're, you're correct that it is a little confusing to have the wavelength difference on, uh, and the difference in the... Th in the two-dimensional shape of the sun uh, there, but uh, but there isn't much overlap, so there's no confusion. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. That's and then you uh, don't have to get that slip right there uh, during yeah. the 30 seconds or two minutes of, of totality and maybe miss it entirely. Yes. Okay. All right. Ex wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. So, so these are called slitless spectra. Slitless spectra. Yeah. Okay. And so, and so here you see some Coronal lines, here's nickel 13, and also some chromospheric lines and, and prominences. Okay. But, uh, enable, but the ability to do this depends on not having a whole background uh, of uh, the continuum uh, normal photospheric spectrum. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyway, we did have my 400 millimeter Nikon lens and a Nikon D850 for eight and a half minutes of totality nearly. Uh, on a chartered a Boeing 787, and Glenn Schneider from the University of Arizona makes those calculations, ranges that uh, that flight, and we have some images from uh, from there. Here is uh, the set of uh, sunspot number uh, over well uh, about 70 years. Um, now, sunspot number is not actually the number of sunspots, but it does happen to be the thing that's been kept track of for, uh, for over 150 years. It's actually 10 times the number of groups plus the number of spots. So if there's one sunspot on the sun, the sunspot number is 11. If there are two, 
if they're next to each other, it's one group and the sunspot number is 12. But if they're on opposite sides of the sun, uh, say the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, the sunspot number is then 22 because there's one spot and one group on the top, and one spot and one group on the bottom. So, so anyway, this has been kept uh, track of. Uh, I showed you a butterfly diagram earlier. That's actually compared. I didn't mention it then with the area covered with sunspots, which you also can measure, but it's a lot harder to measure than just keeping track of the sunspot number. And we do have the historic sunspot numbers going back to uh, the middle 19th century. Anyway, so here uh, we've put the different spacecraft uh, that have uh, been studying the sun. And of course you can't point Hubble at the sun, it's just too bright. Uh, we've blown out in an instant and it's programmed to never go anywhere near the sun in the sky. But uh, the Japanese had its Yoko uh, spacecraft up from around 1990, and, and eventually that was superseded by Hinode, that is still operating. And then the European Space Agency's SOHO, which carries those two coronagraphs from the Naval Research Laboratory, um, went up in 1995. Uh, and it also has on it uh, imaging in several different, uh, different wavelengths. But that imaging has been taken over by the Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, well, and and, uh, and and now on the GO spacecraft uh, has overlapping imaging. So they, so on SOHO, they really are only operating full time in visualization, uh, the the uh, two coronagraphs, and they take a daily picture uh, or so of uh, uh, through the filters uh, just to keep uh, the series up. But the main Filtered images are taken with Solar Dynamics Observatory or now the uh, NOAA uh, spacecraft. Um, the, uh, their, the Proba 2 spacecraft is a European spacecraft out of the Royal Observatory of Belgium. Um, and uh, I think have an image uh, from that. So that is uh, looking at a coronal uh, line for, for that imaging. And then Stereo is getting a 3D view of the sun by having two spacecraft that are partway around the, uh, the sun's uh, orbit. Um, but I'm sure my wife will answer that phone. Sorry about that phone. Uh, anyway, um, one of the two seri uh, stereos is surviving, but we are getting some view of the backside of the, uh, of the sun. Anyway, here in 2019, we see the SUVI, the Solar Ultraviolet Imager. So that sun goes 16, and this is a view in the helium gas, which is around 60,000 degrees from ionized helium, 50, 60,000 degrees. Uh, you can see a little activity on the surface of the sun. You can see a little less activity near the poles. Those are called coronal holes. And then surrounded, uh, we have uh, uh, the, uh, one of our composite images. You see the polar plumes here uh, and, uh, and the equatorial streamers. And our alumnus from Williams College from almost 20 years ago, Dan Seaton, was working at the Royal Observatory of Belgium and is now on NOAA uh, in Boulder, uh, working especially with those uh, uh, imaging, SUVI uh, imaging, um, and uh, jointly with his position at the University of Colorado uh, here. It's long credit. And putting together several of the sous vide colors, uh, we can see the temperature structure on this side of the sun that's facing us. Uh, and of course, that's pasted on over the dark silhouette of the moon. And here's our eclipse um, composite here. And then outside that, the C2 coronagraph uh, imaging. Um, and you can see that the corona is much weaker at this point in the solar minimum than it was at uh, nearer to solar maximum. And we're still at solar minimum, so we're looking for a configuration like this uh, again next month. Uh, now the central image uh, shows iron 12, 11 times ionized iron, so it's not as hot as the iron 14, but still you see the coronal holes here, a little bit of the equator, you can see uh, magnetic field structure on the surface of the sun there in the middle, but it's the stuff near the limb that's going to affect the corona that goes off to the sides. Now, not all the eclipses, of course, are total. About every 
18 months or so, somewhere in the world there is a total eclipse, but also about every 18 months or so, somewhere in the world there is an annular eclipse, and they go off to the sides, uh, of course, for the partial phases. But in any case, on uh, December 26, the day after Christmas, there was an annular eclipse in 2019 uh, that went over uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and South India, and centered in Malaysia, but the weather statistics were much better here. So I went to, uh, uh, to South uh, India to, uh, to observe that, uh, that eclipse. And we had uh, some clouds and some clear weather. Uh, so when it was clear, I needed my filters. One part in a million or so passed through uh, and it cleared up at the end. Uh, and, and in the middle, uh, there was a certain amount of haze, so we didn't even need a filter and could, well, I had a much shorter exposure in my Nikons, but we could observe the uh, annular phase without any filter uh, at all, and then the sun came and, uh, came and went. There uh, was then the eclipse since then was on June 21st, um, but uh, because of the COVID uh, travel restrictions, uh, and I wouldn't have wanted to go to South Sudan anyway, uh, but or, or Yemen, uh, but we did work with people in Saudi Arabia and Oman to uh, make measurements, uh, especially of the temperature, uh, and uh, and so we're working on a scientific article uh, about that. Uh, so whereas it was minus 30 or so uh, for the 2015 eclipse up in Svalbard in the Arctic, now. The temperature went down from about 130 degrees to 120 degrees or so at this eclipse on June 21st in uh, in Saudi Arabia, and we got some observations from Pakistan and India and, and all the way over in uh, in Guam, and uh, I've uh, was unable to travel anywhere in the path, uh, even not to to uh, Europe to see partial phases, uh, so I've collected all kinds of observations and have an article with the various people's observations going into the February issue of Astronomy Magazine, uh, which will be out in early, uh, in early January, and have a, a proof of that that we're, work, that we're working on. The weather statistics, this is the kind of thing that Jay Anderson displays in his eclipsofile.com website, where blue is good, uh, down zero or 20% uh, cloudiness, whereas uh, always cloudy, 100% is, is reddish here, so you can see that, that the chances of observing were, uh, were better here than they would have been in China. We originally had a plan to go to Tibet, and that didn't work out, and uh, uh, there was one observation from Guam. Jay, can I inject a question, yes. please, from, 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 from Celeste Walwork? Uh, she says that uh, I'd always heard that when a star starts manufacturing iron, it was done for. But you're referencing iron isotopes in the spectrum. Uh, can you? Uh, that she points that out as an apparent inconsistency. Well, I know what she's. I know what she's saying, uh, and she's correct that when the star starts manufacturing iron at its core, it's done for. And, and uh, if it's a big a giant star, we get a supernova. Uh, and then that gas is spread out into space, and that's been going on for, uh, for more than 10 billion years. And so the stars that have formed more recently than that, such as our sun, which formed 5 billion years uh, ago, formed out of gas that has iron in it from previous generations of stars that have exploded. So we do talk about so-called metals, but to an astronomer like me, uh, there are three th kinds of things, hydrogen, helium, and metals, everything hmm. heavier than helium, which is, of course, not their usual use. But uh, the sun is basically 90% hydrogen atoms and another 9% or so helium atoms and less than 1% of everything else, including that iron. But that is enough uh, to form all those absorption lines, the front half of lines that we see in the, in the spectrum. Wonderful. Thank you. Celeste, did that get it for you? All right, it did. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, but that brings up another interesting historical point, which is not usually part of my solo lecture, but it's a good question. Um, it was assumed 
that the sun was made out of the same things that the earth uh, was made of with a lot of iron and whatever, silicon or, or whatever else. Uh, and then in the 1920s, a young woman named Cecilia Payne came over from England uh, to work at the Harvard Observatory. Uh, and there is a new biography of her that I, uh, that I recommend. Um, and uh, she wrote in 1925 what's been called the most brilliant thesis ever done in astronomy. Um, and she uh, used some new theory that came out of a young scientist named Saha in India with observation spectra that had been, uh, been made at Harvard and concluded, in fact, that the sun was mainly hydrogen um, and not iron, as had been uh, hmm. thought. Uh, and, uh, but that thesis was shown to the then Dean of American Astronomy, Henry Norris Russell, a professor at Princeton, who said, well, this can't be. Um, and, and she wound up, Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, Cecilia Payne, later Payne Gaposchkin, uh, pre presenting her results in her thesis and then uh, added a sentence that said something like, uh, but, but this is obviously not true. Well, it took a few more years uh, before uh, Russell did some other measurements and Saha's theory became better established and Donald Menzel, also at Harvard, um, did some measurements that uh, indicated that it could be true. And Cecilia Payne was vindicated and she's credited with the, with the uh, discovery uh, that the sun and the stars are mainly made of hydrogen. So there's been controversy. Was she put upon because she was a woman, um, that she wasn't believed at that time in 1925, but especially in some work by the distinguished historian of science, David Borkin at the National Air and Space Museum yep. and, and mm -hmm. others. If, uh, if you as a graduate student come out with a result that disagrees with everything that everybody has known for hundreds of years, uh, they're not going to accept what you said right away. And it's going to yeah. take a little more work to establish. So the general theory, and, uh, and I, I think I, I agree, was, was that there was, there was enough doubt in the uh, Saha theory and, and her being a, a young graduate student not to accept uh, her result right away. Uh, but to try to establish what took a few mm -hmm. years. But we now credit, uh, credit her uh, with that uh, discovery. Uh, she did uh, um, eventually marry uh, a Soviet emigre uh, astronomer, uh, Sergei Gapashkin. She became uh, Mrs. Payne Gapashkin. She was a uh, professor of astronomy and chair of the, we said the chairman then at Harvard. Uh, the astronomy department when I was a freshman there and went to my first eclipse with Donald Menzel. So it was a normal situation for uh, a distinguished female astronomer uh, to uh, be in charge of the department then. And only subsequently did I learn that she was the only female who had been promoted to a professorial position uh, at Harvard at the, t at the time uh, compared with hundreds of male uh, professors, and, uh, and and now we certainly give her a, a lot of credit. We know the circumstance, and she'd only been actually a professor for a few years when Donald Menzel had become director of the observatory and realized that she didn't have a professorial appointment. Um, he saw that her salary was doubled and she was given the, uh, the professorship, and, uh, and of course wow. she uh, really merited it. So anyway, Thanks for uh, the that's history. Related to the story, yeah. to the discovery that we credit to Cecilia Payne Kapashkin that the sun and the stars are mainly made out of hydrogen. Great. Thanks for the history uh, lesson. You're welcome. And I can send you uh, a link to the uh, to a review that uh, that uh, I've written and a, and a separate review that my wife has written uh, to the uh, book that you can. Uh, that you yes, we'd love to contribute that to the, the name and title uh, of, of the book. Thank you. Uh, anyway, um, so I was originally going to go to Tibet, uh, where there were, and if we went from Lhasa out into the countryside, we had hopes of seeing it, but then that possibility disappeared, and we didn't really want to go here because the weather statistics were so bad. Um, and anyway, we have these observations from 
from Oman and uh, Pakistan and, and uh, India, but not not me in person. So as far as total eclipses, I've shown you some things about our observations from 2019, July 2nd, uh, the next eclipse. Then, as you see, this narrow path, but it's now centered over Argentina and, and Chile. The actual center is right there, the maximum totality. Um, and uh, I've had observational plans uh, to uh, observe from Las Cruces on the Atlantic coast, but at the moment, we're not allowed to go into Argentina. And in spite of uh, the officials sending a request, we haven't heard uh, back uh, from that. There was going to be a meeting of, of the International Astronomical Union at Bariloche, in which I was giving a lecture, but that's now been made virtual. Um, but we have some success with the Chilean government uh, and a letter of support from the director of the Cerro Tololo Observatory. So we actually have official permission from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to enter Chile to make some observations in Chile in 2020. And we're working on those details and we've, we've been improving our equipment and we just bought a lot of extra packing uh, cases and we have some plane reservations, but not entirely. So this is in progress now and the eclipse is only about five weeks in the future. Uh, so we hope we're going to be able to observe from there. The following year, the eclipse uh, goes over Antarctica. The weather statistics are not that great. There are a couple of, uh, of uh, ways of going to observe it from the glacier here, from uh, the Union Glacier uh, at, uh, at great expense. But uh, Glenn Schneider has plotted out a path to go observe the sunrise point over here. I have a seat on the plane from Punta Arenas to observe that eclipse over here. So I hope that works. Of course, we can't take our big instruments on the, on the plane, but we'll do what we can from the plane. Then 2022, there's no total eclipse. 2023 is on the other side of the world, uh, clips the upper left-hand corner of Australia and goes into East Timor uh, and the part of the island of New Guinea, the Indonesian part. Um, and then uh, 2024, the totality comes up from the Pacific, hits the Mazatlan area and Mexico, and then goes into Texas and up through Cleveland and Buffalo and northern New England and out to the maritime Canadian provinces. So I'm sure everybody who's on this uh, viewing here on, on listening to my talk now will be trying to go to, uh, to that one. The um, before uh, before then next June, there's an annular eclipse that starts north of the Canadian border where we're at the moment not allowed to go. Uh, but partial phases actually extend down through the eastern part of the United States, barely to you uh, here. But you see the uh, at sunrise at zero degrees is mm. the maximum there. But by the end of the partial eclipse, it's 10 degrees above the horizon. So you might just barely uh, get to see a little bit of the beginning of partial phases of that annual eclipse of June 10th, 2021. And then this is the path for this uh, Punta Arenas to the sunrise point that I, that I already showed you on that other map. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then for only forty thousand dollars. One of the travel agents is arranging some <laughs> camp uh, there for Antarctica, with uh, not favorable weather. We've been having a fight on the solar eclipse mailing list today, in which I've been participating on the word hybrid solar eclipse, uh, because this eclipse doesn't appear on many lists you see of total eclipses. Here's a map by Jay Anderson. Uh, with the cloudiness statistics, and you can see the blue is good and red reddish is not so good. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, there's a total eclipse because except for a little bit at the beginning and a little bit at the end, it's total. So I think it should be called a total eclipse. So it will appear in a table of total eclipses, uh, whereas the hybrid eclipse just sometimes is omitted from, uh, from tables. But anyway, on April 20th, 2023, uh, there's a little bit of uh, Australia, a very, very little bit uh, that that has the eclipse there, but with very favorable observing uh, statistics. 
and then it goes over East Timor uh, and, uh, and over the uh, Indonesian part of the island of New Guinea. Uh, and then there'll be an annular solar eclipse on October 14th, 2023, uh, that uh, will go over Oregon and, uh, and Texas with pretty uh, favorable observing conditions. And there'll be a partial eclipse visible through the whole United States uh, on occasion. Of course, uh, bigger coverage the closer you get to the path of annularity, which will then go down to Central America, Mexico, Central America, uh, and out of the Brazil. Uh, so actually, Jay, this yeah. diagram raises, uh, uh, I think, is germane to a question that one of our folks have. Um, uh, that uh, Manjanath Rao is asking is like, is even though the moon goes around the earth in a fixed orbit, why is it that we see the solar eclipses not occur in the same region every time, but in over different regions of the earth? Well, um, let, let me give you a brief yeah, answer. I'm sure. And I can refer you to a couple of books of mine, including one called The Sun, um, which came out, uh, came out last year. And there's something called the Saros. So the, the orbit of the moon around the earth is elliptical, uh, following Kepler's first law. Uh, and the orbit of the moon is tilted uh, five degrees with respect to the earth's pass around, around the sun. So all the circumstances come back together to have another eclipse, not every month because of the tilt, but it turns out that the, uh, the months by the moon and the months by the stars work out uh, to, uh, to come back to the same cir circumstance after 18 years, 11 and a third days. Hmm. And the third of a day means that the earth rotates a third of the way around. This is called the Saros series. So if you have an eclipse now, 18 years and 11 and a third days later, there'll be an eclipse a third of the way around the earth and it'll take 54 years and 34 days uh, before the eclipse comes back to where you are. Uh, and then the things that the alignment is not exactly precise, so it's a little further north, a little further south. Uh, okay. I do have uh, maps uh, in, my, in my books and articles that show the progression of the Saros series, and you can see the path. Every so, in fact, I, I just updated for the new edition that's gonna come out of my Peterson Field Guide to the Stars and Planets. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a graph showing where, uh, when, when the eclipses are, uh, and you can see the progression um, over uh, from year to year of the 18 years and then, uh, and then coming back around. Got it. Does that answer your question? Manjanath, does that get it for you? So, Yep. So the, the 18 years, 11 and third day period is known as the Saros period. And it turns out that the full set of three is called an exelegmos, E-X-I-L-A-G-M-O-S, a word I learned only fairly recently. So I have actually been observing long enough that I have seen an exelegmos of, uh, of eclipses starting <laughs> back in 1959. And you kept asking, adding 18 years, and I can see the, the different things in the Saros series. Uh, oh, oh, and incidentally, this includes a, a period of the shape of the orbit where the moon is a little closer, a little further. So uh, when you get the moon a little closer, it's, it's a bigger in angle. And so we have a longer eclipse. And when it's uh, further away, we get smaller and get a shorter eclipse. So, so these eclipses that occur after 18 years, 11 and third days also have the same kind of of uh, totality, they're either a long series or a short series. So the uh, the longest uh, eclipse uh, in the series in 1973, there was one uh, in uh, that went across uh, Africa. I did some reconnoitering in Africa, north of Timbuktu, to see if we could observe from there. It actually reached seven minutes and four seconds of totality. And they had 18 years to 1991, we got to 2009. So that was the eclipse that went over China. And incidentally, it went, went over the city of Wuhan. I, uh, I didn't go there, but that's when I first heard the name Wuhan that we've been hearing more recently. And 
of the circumstances. Uh, and add another 18 years, 11 and a third days, you get uh, from, a nine, from 2009 to uh, 2027. So there'll be a very long eclipse in 2027. But uh, people I know are mainly looking up from between now and 2024. 24, sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyway, so here's uh, <clears throat> from uh, Xavier's uh, website, the map of this annular eclipse here. So I put in uh, where I am in, uh, in Williamstown here. So we'll get two and a half hours of partial eclipse and it'll be 38 degrees or so high in the sky there. So it could be a big partial here. I expect to be uh, somewhere in, in annularity, of course, but uh, the whole country will get a partial eclipse. And, uh, and I put in your position near Washington, D.C., uh, and it'll be 40 degrees or so, 40, 42 degrees maximum uh, of the solar diameter uh, will be covered uh, at, the, uh, at the eclipse and 30 percent of the area or, or so at max. Uh, at uh, the maximum. And then the total eclipse of 2024, uh, as I said, comes from the Pacific over uh, Miowatlan, uh, uh, sorry, over uh, Mazatlan. Miowatlan was where the 1970 eclipse was in Oaxaca. But anyway, Mazatlan with excellent weather statistics, and then Texas and, and up through the uh, Midwestern and Eastern uh, United, uh, United States. Uh, here is the cloud cover um, that Jay Anderson has has measured, and you can see blue is best. So I'm anticipating being somewhere down here. Uh, Texas is uh, is not quite as good in statistics. Uh, the Midwest is not is not as uh, as good. We're getting up to 50, 60 percent chance of of uh, cloudy weather here, and April is not the best season in the uh, in the Northeast. So here's where I'm planning to be on April 8th, 2024. Uh, <clears throat> here's the cloud cover shown in, in more detail here. You see Mazatlan is right near the center line there. And uh, well, here's uh, Buffalo and, and average 70% or so of uh, cloudiness. Um, And then let me uh, see the path here near near where I am in in Williamstown uh, here. Uh, so so uh, again, forty degrees high in the sky for for that eclipse. But people can drive north a couple of hours. Middlebury College is at the southern end of that path of uh, totality. In, uh, in uh, in 2024, here's your Washington again. And then in October 24, uh, October 2nd, the path will come back to Chile and Argentina uh, here. Uh, the statistics are not good in, in Chile, though. Argentina is better. But look out here. The Easter Island turns out to be in the path of annularity. So I've just been talking with my travel agent about arrangements to go back to Easter Island, where we did see a wonderful total eclipse in 2010, and to observe the annular solar eclipse in 2024, over 2024. So here's a movie from our site in 2017. So now we have totality. So you see how excited people were getting, and we did have a couple of minutes of totality in 2017. And uh, I let this run uh, a few seconds, and you can see that during an eclipse, 20, uh, two minutes of totality is actually long enough to look around, take some pictures. 
Take out your binoculars, look at the shape of the corona. Take some more pictures. If you're smart, you just look with your binoculars and not take any pictures, not distract yourself. We now are able to just put a, a, a key on, on my computer and the sequence will be, uh, will be taken. You program that in advance. So J Janet Cook actually has a question about the eclipse here. She says, yes. 2020, 2017 eclipse. It seems we're beginning to go out of totality here. I think I begin to see a little brightening on one side of the sun, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. She said, it seemed that the uh, diamond ring first appeared at the one o'clock position as the eclipse began and then moved to the nine o'clock as it ended. Is it possible or are, her, are my observation skills off? I'm, I'm not, say again, when? Sure. At this eclipse, it, it appeared. This movie? Sure. She says, it appeared to me that the diamond ring first appeared at the one o'clock position as the eclipse began. In this move, in this particular eclipse? No, no, no. no. When she saw it, when, when when she was observing. Oh, when and she was observing. Nine o'clock when it ended. Yeah. And is it possible to have, for, for that to be appear in those, in, in locations that are not diametrically opposed? Uh, yes. If you're not right on the, yeah. If you're not right, right on the center line? Yeah. I believe so, yes. Okay. Anyway, as you see, if this movie is still running. Uh, I wouldn't say it's boring, but uh, <laughs> but the uh, two minutes of the eclipse is uh, uh, is really is really fairly long. And uh, but it's a wonderful thing, and everybody's very exciting, excited, and I wish you all luck for your eclipse observing. Well, thank you very much. Thank you indeed. It's quite a tour, um, and it gives us some, some good stuff to look forward to. Like I hadn't known about the annular one coming up uh, in twenty three, and I may now have to find a spot other than my parents' backyard for the twenty four eclipse in northwestern Ohio. That does not predictions aren't looking good at that point. Um, <laughs> But well, it depends whether it's most more important to be with your parents or to be no, absolutely take them with you to Mazatlan. Mazatlan. Oh. There we go. There we go. That'd be the trick. Hey, so before we break, does anyone else have any any final questions for Jay? If you do, please take yourself off mute and just ask. I had a question. Please. Uh, it's John Bruch. I remember at the beginning or near the beginning of your presentation you mentioned something about the uh, diameter of the sun uh, being more visible or, or carefully determined yes. and yes. it struck me that that might be a, li a bit like saying the thickness of the atmosphere of the earth uh, how, well you're right to but, what but, but terminator it, it, to use but it's the level of it's the level that the International Astronomical Union um, uses for the nominal size of the sun. Is that to a particular phenomenon within the solar atmosphere or something? Well, if you do uh, the so-called radiative transfer, the average uh, depth looking at the center of the sun is what we call tau equal two thirds. We're looking through the solar gas until it gets so hazy we don't see anymore by a factor of, of one over e um, but if you're looking near the edge then you're looking diagonally through the gas so the opacity um, averages out to to be uh, essentially opaque at a at a higher level uh, that's why the sun is a little darker near near the edge but there is a point when you're looking near the edge that it it looks opaque to you, uh, and then a little, a, a small angle further out, it looks transparent. And that difference in angle is is uh, less than a minute of arc, and you don't, and less than you would see with your eye. It oh, turns yeah. out that that's a significant calculation to make when there's a transit of Venus or Mercury. Um, and uh, and uh, I had the good fortune to observe the transits of. Venus of 2004 and 2012 and several 
transits of Mercury. And, uh, and you can see what's called the black drop effect at the edge of the sun because, uh, because you're, you're sampling with this external occulter, uh, this uh, very rapidly uh, diminishing uh, opacity. Uh, opacity. So oh. the, uh, the edge phenom phenomena are, uh, are complicated, um, but, but for the eclipse, the, the question is what is bright enough to make a Bailey's bead? And uh, at, a certain, at a certain point, the, 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 uh, the solar gas has gotten faint enough that it won't do it. And the question is, what is that radius? And Those are two different radiuses, aren't they? Hmm? Those are two different radius radii, though, isn't it? Aren't they? What, what, what are the two? The one uh, to which the atmosphere becomes opaque, uh, looking through the atmosphere, glazing grazingly at a far star or something, I suppose, and the other at which the the atmosphere is luminous enough to form a Bailey's bead. Well, across those the are moon. those. Your I agree that those are defined differently, but what the actual difference is. Uh, that an angle that I don't know. Oh, it'd be minuscule though. I, I think, I think so. Okay, thank you. Very good. Well, Jay, um, thank you. Oh, Alan, please go ahead. I have a question. Yeah, um, Jay, you showed some beautiful pictures where the the radial gradient in the corona had been removed and the fine details had yes. been retained. Yes. Is that software available? Because I know we have members who collected um, groups of photographs in 2017. We'll be doing more in the future. Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's. Uh, it's not just one particular software. It's not that we have our observations and put them in and crank out a result. There, there are experts in doing this uh, who worked hard to get uh, to get those. Uh, you saw some by my student Christian, who worked for a while. We worked with. We've worked in the past with Milislav Druckmuller, uh, who's worked on our data and now is working only on on uh, some of, of himself and his own uh, his own group. But I also work with Wendy Carlos in New York, who uses Photoshop to put together the best parts of a couple of dozen images, and she is is making uh, something that looks more like what you see with the eye without the the very high contrast. So there's just a variety. There's no one standard. Uh, program that I uh, that I know of, Nicholas Lefodeau, uh, some of you may have have seen, uh, uh, put together 646 different images, the best parts of those to look way way out, even beyond the coronagraphs, uh, and and you'll see his um, uh, his uh, picture on the cover of the new uh, of the new book with uh, the hundred years of of eclipse uh, predictions by uh, Michael Zeiler and Michael Beckage. Okay, thank you. So, so the answer is I do not, there is not a program that you press a button and put these in. And, and, and I, I think I remember Strick, uh, I, I believe the name Strick Muller or Strick Muller. Druck Muller. Druck Muller had begun to publish his software. Did he stop doing that? Well, he has. Uh, there are research articles of which he's a co-author, uh, but I don't know that the software itself is available to other people. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because uh, those are fascinating images to see that detail in that structure. That just—I don't think I'd ever seen that before in in anything. Um, I understand the genesis of the question. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jay, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your Sunday evening with us and sharing, uh, you know, sharing the photos, the the information, the stories, the predictions for the upcoming stuff. This has been extraordinary. Just thank you so much. And uh, thank I, you for everybody. Please join me in uh, you know a round of virtual applause if we will <laughs> for our guest. I know it's kind of hard to do with. Uh, with the camera, I see, I see okay. some hands applauding. So thank yeah, you. Yeah. So thank you. So thank you very, very much. So so I do have uh, various of my eclipse observations posted at uh, totalsolareclipse.org. Uh, 
and you can go into the archive there and see images from various eclipses and link to some right. other articles and releases at the various eclipses. And then uh, my uh, at solarcorona.com, I have a list of, of my books, which include the Peterson Field Guide and the, the book The Sun that has uh, with uh, Leon Golub as, uh, as first author uh, that has information about the, well, all parts of the sun and including the Saros series. Fabulous. I know we'll be checking them out. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. And everyone have a good rest of the month. And we will.